Good morning, Hope Church Second Service. Good morning. Good morning. Hey, for all of you, the females who were blessed by being mothers today, happy Mother's Day to all of you. I think that's wonderful. <laughs> Last week, if you were here, you got to see our youth in action and uh, got to see them play the music and do the collections and everything like that. And their leaders, one of their leaders up here, Will Brute, and you got to see him preach, and I think he did a good job. Will, thank you very much. I can remember when this church only had about, well, I think it was three girls in the youth group, and they were the pastor's daughters. So we've come a long way since then, I'll tell you. Rock the Ridge is next Saturday, as a lot of you know. Yeah. It's one of our big outreach programs where we give money back to the community. We, last year, I think, or the last Rock the Ridge, I think we served uh, 400 meals plus meals to people. Uh, we did bounce houses and all of that stuff, plus give a great free concert. And we were able to raise about two or three thousand dollars to turn over to the community. So this year we're doing this particular Rock the Ridge next Saturday. We're doing the same thing, and <clears throat> so that one person doesn't get stuck doing everything for the longest time. Please, if you go go to the Rock the Ridge, try and be there and, and stop in and ask somebody that's working a popcorn booth or a, the bounce house or something. Say, hey, can I relieve you for a little while, half an hour, an hour, or something like that? And just you know, it's kind of like 
you're doing the Lord's work, believe it or not, to watch a bunch of monster kids in a bounce house. It doesn't seem right, but it is. That's what you're doing. Anyway, so please, there's sign-ups out there, and, and if you can, please show up and, and enjoy it. It's an awful lot of fun for everybody, and it's, it's Hope Church giving back to the community. Man Camp is coming up, and if you haven't signed up for Man Camp, Mike Bowers is teaching Sunday school right now, but he'll be here after the service. And uh, if you want to pay him or talk to him about coming to that, it's coming up near the end of the month here. And it is an awful lot of fun. We have a great time. We really do. And it's local so that you can get up there, and it's not like a two-hour drive or anything. It's just above Megalia. Um, yesterday, the hikers in this church, I can't believe there's a hiking ministry. Unbelievable. These, t these are the rattlesnake wranglers. They, uh, they hike 10 miles. 12 people hiked 10 miles up to Feather Falls, and I guess they just had a really great time. Most of them looked a little sore today, as a matter of fact, so I want kind of stuff like that. And then if you were here last week and you stayed for the Mexican dinner that Juan's wife made, everybody, it was wonderful. Thank you, Juan. It really was good. You raised enough money to send 30 kids uh, yesterday to Six Flags, so thank you very much. A youth group with 30 instead of three is, it's like a lot more than that. Um, you're going to like church today, and I tell you, I've been going to church not that long, probably about 12, 14 years in my whole life, and uh, I've never heard anything Leonard Skinner in a church before. I never heard Alvis before I came to this church, and now you can hear a little Skinner, Leonard Skinner today. It's, it's crazy. Anyways, take a moment to say hello to somebody that you don't know.
So many times will I praise you today? I lift up my life as you're always the same, and my offering to you.
Savior. How many songs can I sing to proclaim your wondrous love? Oh, and beauty so great. Everybody's got a story to tell And everybody's got a word to be healed How one of the lips beauty healed Cause oh, I get so tired of holding on trying to hear that still small voice I'm trying to hear
how many times have you given me strength? Today, as we worship God, we're also celebrating Mother's Day. Our moms gave us the gift of physical life, and many of us had moms that pointed us in the direction of the spiritual gift of life, Jesus Christ. And in communion, we remember that in God, we have a parent who loves us unconditionally so much that even despite our faults, he went to the cross for us. He is a parent that is always there. We celebrate that in him, we have the gift of life. One morning if you wake up and the sun does not appear. is unclear I rise I will be here The surest seasons are made for a change Our lifetimes are made for years So I as sure as seasons are made for a change our lifetimes are made for these years so I'll rise I will be here we'll be together and I
find me tonight. Say it will be all right. I will believe. Broken and true. Ooh, and I know you're wrong to me. That I only come on when I'm so. Seems like every time I try to make it right, it all comes down on me. Please say honestly, you won't give up on me. And I shall believe. And I shall believe. And open the door. Show me your face tonight. Oh, and I know it's true. No one heals me like you. You hold the key. Never again. I turn away. So heavy tonight, but your love is alright. But I do believe that not everything is gonna be the way you think it ought to be. Seems like every time I try to make it right, it all comes down on me. Please say. Church Second Service, are you glad to be here today? Yeah. Amen. It's good to see you. We welcome you. Also, if you're watching online, thank you for joining us. I want to say happy Mother's Day to a beautiful woman named Tracy who's watching from her desk. Thanks for being an amazing mom that you are to our great kids. And we want to do something for all the, the moms that are here. With the men, we make them stand but we don't on Father's Day, but we don't want to do that to the moms. So if you're a mom, you have to raise your hand, okay? And Ronnie's going to help me out. Happy Mother's Day. Man, I get a lot of points when we do this every year. <laughs> Happy Mother's Day. That's a lot of fun, actually. Happy Mother's Day. Happy Mother's Day. We got more moms this year. Happy Mother's Day. This is awesome. Happy Mother's Day. Happy Mother's Day. Happy Mother's Day. We're at the other end? Okay. Oh, you can reach? Oh, thank you. Happy Mother's Day. You shouldn't have had to get up. Moms always have to get up and serve and help. And happy Mother's Day, Rosie. This right here is a, a couple who was with me in Portland, and we had a great experience there. Terry was an executive for a company there, and I asked him to be a, we called him life group, like our hope group, be a life group leader. He says, I don't know if I'm qualified for that. And I 
said, well, why don't you just come to this little seminar? Kind of sucked him in and uh, became a great leader and then went on to Michigan and uh, became an elder in that church. And they helped uh, support Tracy and I when we were looking for where we were to go, which we ended up being here at Hope. And I wanted you to all know about that because they're part of our family here. So it's good to have them here. They live in that other country called Texas. <laughs> Happy Mother's Day. Love you. Happy Mother's Day. Happy Mother's Day. Did I skip one? Oop, thank you. Happy Mother's Day. Happy Mother's Day, Gail. Thank you. Happy Mother's Day. Let's see here. Can I squeeze through here? I'm sorry. Happy Mother's Day. Oh, thank you. Happy Mother's Day. Awesome. Yes. Happy Mother's Day. Okay, this one on the far end here, I'm going to go around there. This is Carol Hansford, who never has her kids with her. Uh, they're kind of scattered around. They're never with her on Mother's Day. And she spends all this time getting all these flowers for us. And she's a special mom in Israel. And I say happy Mother's Day, Carol. Thank you. Happy Mother's Day. I'll come back around there. Happy Mother's Day. <laughs> Okay, where am I at? Right here. Happy Mother's Day. Happy Mother's Day. Thank you. Happy Mother's Day. Thank you. Happy Mother's Day. Happy Mother's Day. <laughs> Thanks, Ronnie. Happy Mother's Day, Laura. Oh, over here. Happy Mother's Day. Okay. You're doing good, buddy. Happy Mother's Day. Happy Mother's Day. Happy Mother's Day. Happy Mother's Day. Hey. Happy Mother's Day. All right. Did I forget any? Oh, this is awesome. Man, we're growing in moms every year. That's, that means we're, uh, we have a bright future as long as we do that. We uh, also have, we're going to come back to the subject of moms in a little bit in our message, but we have some good news that we wanted to get out there because it's so exciting. We, um, we just kept packing the house, and I kept feeling like I got to talk to builders, and I was trying to do that, and it, I wasn't getting it done. And I realized, you know, there's guys in our church that are much more talented than me anyway in, in those areas. And uh, so I talked to Bob Prevo. Bob is uh, someone who had a, a great career in law enforcement and now is a consultant and goes all over the country now helping out. And uh, I, he's got, he and Connie have done incredible stuff at their homes. So I know he understands the idea of working with permits and different people and workers. So I asked him to lead a team. And uh, that team has some good news right now. Our building expansion team, they're going to come on up. Let's welcome our building expansion team. Hand in the baton. This is Bob. This is Dave, who's a contractor himself and a builder. And uh, this is Steve, who's a painter. We got Steve and Trudy through Rock the Ridge, and now they do our signs. Isn't that awesome? And uh, this is Marvin, who is uh, gifted uh, in doing our architect work and our drawings, and uh, turns out to be a uh, believer, too, and, uh, and he's really helping us. And uh, it's really a, a blessing that we got him through Dave. And then Chuck down here has a, a tile business, and he's an entrepreneur. He's worked with uh, business leaders in the community here and knows how to lead a team. And so these guys have just been awesome. They, they're get-or-done kind of guys. So I'll turn it over to Bob. Thank you, Stan. Uh, the last job I had before I retired was to help design a new jail. And in this case, we want people to actually come to the building, so we, we had to rethink things. Fortunately, we have a great team here that was able to do that. Uh, Stan came to us in uh, February uh, with a vision. He says, I, I need to grow the church. We need a new building. We need more seats. And we looked at uh, adding on to this building and looked at the pros and cons, looked at other alt alternatives, and we've come up with a, 
uh, plan to actually build a new building. And you'll see some of the diagrams and the, and the uh, drawings behind you and outside uh, that are here and we'll be able to answer questions for you after service if you like. Outside, we'll all, we'll all hang around after the service. So, because uh, I'd rather listen to Stan than listen to me talk. So I'm just gonna spend about two minutes and just go through a few slides on what we're uh, looking at. Um, this is the plan for the front of the building, which you just saw. Uh, the main worship area, which is the next slide, uh, we want to be able to seat at least 500 people, and that's, that's what we're looking at. Uh, we've got a uh, nice lobby, a stage area, a baptism area, a um, lot of room. You'll see the stairs. The stairs mean we have another floor. So this is going to be a, a, a big building. Uh, next slide. Uh, this is the downstairs, and you'll see we have a full kitchen. Another multi-purpose room, classrooms for the kids, or whatever else you want to use it for. So this is going to be a, a, a very big project. And the building is going to go uh, kind of right behind us, off to the side uh, in that area. So this is what we're planning on doing. Um, what we need is your help. We would like you to look at the plans, ask questions. Uh, there's some cards out there. If you have ideas, if you want to see something uh, in the design or in the in the workings of the new building, please let us know. There's an email address, a phone number to get a hold of us, okay? This is your church, so we want your input. And we thank you very much. Tell them about The Rock. The Rock is the empty tomb. The tomb is empty. <laughs> That's the baptistry with a waterfall. Yeah. Cool, huh? And you get to help us find The Rock and gather The Rock. <laughs> oh, well, I did mention that before. Uh, we're going to use River Rock, so we're going to ask that every, every time you come to church, bring 20 River Rocks, <laughs> throw them in a pile. <laughs> this is going to help us cut down on costs. Yeah. This is a big project, and it's going to involve all of us. Thank you. Let me say a prayer real quick. Let's pray together. God, I thank you for raising up this team and for them assembling the plan already and uh, for the way you brought Marvin into our midst. What a blessing. And uh, I thank you for his help and uh, his faith. And God, just use us. We, we know that the kingdom is about souls, and it's about your glory, and so help us to keep focused on our mission, and that the, the building will be a tool that we dedicate to your glory. In Jesus' name, amen. amen. Let's give it up for the team. Thanks, Bob. <laughs> when uh, the team had been meeting, uh, Bob uh, called me to come and meet with the team, and I walked out front with Marvin. What we were th initially thinking is pop this building out 50 feet and go as far as we could there for code. And we were standing there at the end, and Marvin said, well, you can do this, and you're going to end up having a very long, narrow building, and you're going to spend a lot of money. And he said, have you ever thought of having a metal building? And a metal building you can put up, and then you can sheetrock and fix it up however you want to look but you save a lot of money and you get more building. And so for five, this plan, the goal is $500,000. $500,000 may sound like a lot of money, but uh, if you think about how we spend money for our own homes and we're a bunch of families, and then you think about a bunch of families getting one family or one building, you know, one home for us, it's not that big of a goal. And our goal is uh, not to go in debt. Not, I already have people that have offered to finance it. We don't want to do that and put pressure on the church. Our goal is to raise this money ourselves and build as we do it and do as much of our own work as we can. we got some talented people here that can help with that. And so we're going to start a campaign that will be through November. We're not going to be one of those churches that's always talking about money every week. We're going to talk about souls, stay up on our mission. And we believe God's going to do this. We're going to build this. We're going to have no debt once we get done. Amen? So that's the plan. Yeah. So, uh, the gift of life. We're in a series called Alive, and of course, moms give us the gift of life physically. When God wanted to send someone to pave the way for the Messiah, John the Baptist came through his mom. And even while in his mom, when Mary came to visit Elizabeth, he jumped around, which shows the baby is a living creature and a being inside a mama. And when God wanted to send the Messiah, he came through a mom. And uh, moms play such a huge role. I see them all over the place. They may be in skirts or dresses or sweats or business suits, and they say things like, no, 
and put that down. I told you no. And why didn't you ask first before you brought this person over? Or, uh, you know, they, they pass on, they touch a, and help our owies. And uh, they say things like, my mom, um, it takes a lifetime to build a good reputation. It only takes seconds to destroy it. But then when I screwed up and did something embarrassing, she was right there to say, get up, keep going, keep going. And, you know, it occurred to me uh, this week, I was thinking, this is the first Mother's Day I've ever preached after my mom had passed last December 28th, and uh, it occurred to me as I was thinking about it, every Mother's Day sermon I've ever preached, I bragged on my mom, and I bragged on my wife, who's another incredible mom, and I thought, how blessed I've been to have such a great mom, and I got some nice notes, like, I hope you're okay, I know it's going to be hard, the first one's hard when your, your mom's gone, but really... Uh, I, I feel empowered by my mom, preach a good one. Because she'd, she'd say, preach a good sermon, preach it. You know, she'd like me to get fired up. So I want to dedicate uh, this message to my mom. I want to go to a passage of scripture that we both loved in Hebrews 12. It's on the back of your bulletin if you want to read, or you can follow up here on, uh, on the overhead. But the writer says, therefore, since we are surrounded by a, such a great a cloud of witnesses, let us throw off everything that hinders us, and the sin that so easily entangles. And let us run with perseverance the race marked out for us, fixing our eyes on Jesus, the pioneer and perfecter of faith. For the joy set before him, he endured the cross, scorning its shame, and sat down at the right hand of the throne of God. Now the first word, what's the first word? Therefore. therefore. What do you say when you see a therefore? Therefore. What is it there for, right? What's it there for? Everybody say, what's it there for? What's it there for? It's a transition. So remember when these writers wrote this, they didn't go, this will be chapter 11. We'll put a big 11. And then on the verses, we'll put a little one, little two, little three. They didn't number that. Man in time, in order to help us navigate through the books, put the numbers to help us find our way around. But they just wrote books. So the therefore goes back to chapter 11. And in chapter 11, you have this by faith, by faith, by faith. You have this roll call of faith, by faith uh, Abel offered, and by faith uh, Abraham went. And this word faith is pistuo. I did a word study of it when I was in Bible school. And that, that Hebrew understanding it was uh, for pistuo, by faith, is more than intellectual acknowledgement. It's a willingness to respond. And that's why you have those action verbs with by faith Noah built the ark. By faith, Moses um, left the comforts, being in Pharaoh's family, you know, rich, most powerful family on earth, he left it to, to endure ill treatment with the people of God for a short season. And you have this concept where they're all looking for a better place, a better city, a heavenly one. And Abraham went out not knowing where he was. And Rahab, who was a harlot, became a believer and helped and hid the Israelites. So it's by faith, by faith, by faith. Therefore... Since we're surrounded by such a great cloud of witnesses, he's using terminology like you're in this race, in this stadium, and these great people of faith are cheering us on. And he says, let us uh, throw off everything that hinders and the sin that so easily entangles us. Um, gymnastics came and the games came to the Greeks and the Greeks did uh, the Olympics nude. They actually did. They didn't want anything, any robes, anything to hinder them. And sin can entangle us. A habit, a relationship, a, a something maybe we flirt around with, it can slow us down. Or um, um, de depression, um, discouragement, uh, things that aren't necessarily, they're not necessarily our fault, things that happen to us if we let it. They can entangle us. Religion can entangle us. Being worried about what other people think can entangle you. He says, we gotta, you got to run the race, let go of anything that, that's, that, that is a snare that keeps us from having our eyes on Jesus. Jesus is the author. Here it says pioneer. He, he wrote it. He created the life we live, and he is the perfecter or the finisher, some translations say. He lived it. He lived the life. That, he's not a leader that says, I want you all to live this way. I'm not going to, but you go do it. He lived the life. He was tempted in all things as we are yet without sin. And then he finishes our life. He perfects our life. You and I have failures, but we lay our head on our pillow at night saying, God, I thank you 
that I'm saved, I'm in a relationship with you based on what you did, and I'm trusting in what you did at the cross. So that's keeping our eyes on Jesus. If you've ever seen a runner running who looks around, they're in trouble, right? There's a, there's, you, know, you kind of think, well, where are they at? How close are they? But what they teach in track not to do that is because it'll slow you down. Keep your eyes ahead. And, and, the, and the, the author says, keeping our eyes on Jesus, the author, the perfecter. And it says, he endured the cross. Endurance is the original word. He uses that same word twice. He says, uh, run with perseverance, verse 1. And then he says that Jesus endured the cross. It's a marathon. It's not a sprint. It's not a 40-yard dash. It's a lifetime race that we're in, and we got to keep our eyes on Jesus. And he endured the cross. Now, he wasn't excited about the cross. It says here in this translation, he scorned it. Very strong word. Um, some b- translations say despised it. He who knew no sin was made sin on our behalf, that we might become the righteousness of God. He was separated from the Father. He wasn't all, this is great, I'm going to save and redeem all people all time. This is wonderful. He despised it. He scorned it. You and I go through things we despise and don't like sometimes in this fallen world, but it's a perseverance, it's an endurance, it's a race that we're in, that we go through it looking ahead. And he was looking ahead to the joys, to sit down at the right hand of the Father where he reigns as the King of kings and the Lord of lords, and we who believe are in his kingdom for, forever. So that's the text. Here's the task, all right? Text to the task. The task is, number one, run my race. I put run my race. I want you to think about my race, your race, because everybody has their own race. You run your race, Christ in you, the hope of glory. We get into trouble when we start telling everybody how they're supposed to run their race. When we say, this is what it means to be a disciple. Uh, You run the race by reading the Bible like I do, praying like I do, serving like I do, and I'm going to keep an eye on you to make sure you're running your race right. No, we don't do that around here at Hope. We say, keep your eyes on Jesus. Keep your eyes on Jesus. Who am I to judge someone else's servant? No policeman here. You run your race, I'll run my race. We have people yesterday who went on a hike, and they, walk, they hiked either, I think it was 10 hours or 10 miles. I keep getting that mixed up. 10 miles, that's a good hike. Beautiful scenery. And they were out there enjoying God's glory and, and building relationships that last forever. We had some other people, uh, almost 40 people, I think it was, or was it almost 30, that went to Six Flags. Almost 40 people, counting the adults, that took 20-something teens on a spiritual, fun, though, good time uh, trip to Six Flags. And uh, some of the kids that went had never seen a roller coaster. Some of them were just, like, beaming from this trip. And some adults gave of their own time, volunteered, to take them. You know, you run your race. We got people uh, bringing food because they care about those in need, and they're bringing it out here for people that are in need. We got food going out in the food bags. We got this afternoon some people going out on Blitz. Blitz stands for bringing love, uh, bringing love out in the streets, or something like that. I thought it up. I should remember. But uh, we, we bring the love out there by bringing, finding people uh, that are hurting and going through difficult times and are homeless. There are some people who don't want to go through the profile of our shore ministry. They don't, they don't want to go through the screening. They're just lifers, some of them. And we, we still believe God loves them, amen? And so we go out there and we give them food and we give them resources just because God is about love. You run your race. And don't worry about how others are running their race. We all keep our eyes fixed on Jesus. Run your race. Number two, jump any hurdles in the way. We get hurdles in our way, and we can let those defeat us, or we can, by the power of God, jump through those hurdles. Any of you, of you ever hear of the TED Talks? The TED Talks were started in 84, uh, more focused on technology, but they became widely import, uh, popular and started being uh, focusing on all kinds of areas of life. And uh, they're, they're, they're about spreading ideas worth spreading. And uh, I wanted you to watch one. This is a little longer video than I usually do. It's 10 minutes, but I, it's so good. I want you to hear what this guy has to say. It's one of the, the videos that's gone over 1,000 hits. Uh, and I want you to think about the hurdles this guy has had in his journey that he's had to deal with. Let's check this out. So 
So when I was in art school, I developed a shake in my hand, and this was the straightest line I could draw. Now, in hindsight, it was actually good for some things, like mixing a can of paint or shaking a Polaroid. But at the time, this was really doomsday. This was, this was the destruction of my dream of becoming an artist. The shake developed out of really a single-minded pursuit of pointillism, just years of making tiny, tiny dots. And eventually, these dots went from being perfectly round to looking more like tadpoles because of the shake. So to compensate, I'd hold the pen tighter, and this progressively made the shake worse, so I'd hold the pen tighter still. And this became a vicious cycle that ended up causing so much pain and joint issues, I had trouble holding anything. And after spending all my life wanting to do art, I left art school, and then I left art completely. But after a few years, I just couldn't stay away from art, and I decided to go to a neurologist about the shake and discovered I had permanent nerve damage. And <laughs> he actually took one look at my squiggly line and said, well, why don't you just embrace the shake? So I did. I went home, I grabbed a pencil, and I just started letting my hand shake and shake. I was making all these scribble pictures. And even though it wasn't the kind of art that I was ultimately passionate about, it felt great. And more importantly, once I embraced the shake, I realized I could still make art. I just had to find a different approach to making the art that I wanted. Now, I, I still enjoyed the fragmentation of pointillism, seeing these little tiny dots come together to make this unified whole. So I began experimenting with other ways to fragment images where the shake wouldn't affect the work, like dipping my feet in paint and walking on a canvas. Or in a 3D structure consisting of two by fours, creating a 2D image by burning it with a blowtorch. I discovered that if I worked in a larger scale and with bigger materials, my hand really wouldn't hurt. And after having gone from a single approach to art, I ended up having an approach to creativity that completely changed my artistic horizons. This was the first time I'd encountered this idea that embracing the limitation could actually drive creativity. At the time, I was finishing up school, and I was so excited to get a real job and finally afford new art supplies. I had this horrible little set of tools, and you know, I felt like I could do so much more with the supplies I thought an artist was supposed to have. I actually didn't even have a regular pair of scissors. I was using these metal shears until I stole a pair from the office that I worked at. So I got out of school, I got a job, I got a paycheck, I got myself to the art store, and I just went nuts buying supplies. And then when I got home, I sat down and I set myself to test to really try to create something just completely outside of the box. But I sat there for hours, and nothing came to mind. The same thing the next day, and then the next, quickly slipping into a creative slump. And I was in a dark place for a long time, unable to create. And it didn't make any sense, because I was finally able to support my art, and yet I was creatively blank. But as I searched around in the darkness, I realized I was actually paralyzed by all of the choices that I never had before. And it was then that I thought back to my jittery hands, embraced the shake. And I realized if I ever wanted my creativity back, I, I had to quit trying so hard to think outside of the box and get back into it. I wondered, could you become more creative then by looking for limitations? What if I could only create with a dollar's worth of supplies? At this point, I was spending a lot of my evenings in well, I guess I still spend a lot of my evenings in Starbucks, but I, I know you can ask for an extra cup if you want one. So I decided to ask for 50. Surprisingly, they just handed them right over, and then with some pencils I already had, I made this project for only 80 cents. It really became a moment of clarification for me that we need to first be limited in order to become limitless. I took this approach in thinking inside the box to my canvas and wondered what if instead of painting on a canvas, I could only paint on my chest. So I painted 30 images, one layer at a time, one on top of another, with each picture representing an influence in my life. Or what if instead of painting with a brush, I could only paint with karate chops? <laughs> so I dipped my hands in paint, and I just, I just attacked the canvas, and I actually hit so hard that I bruised a joint in my pinky, and it was stuck straight for a couple weeks. <laughs> or what if, what if instead of relying on myself, I had to rely on other people to create the content for the art. 
So for six days, I lived in front of a webcam, I slept on the floor, and I ate takeout. And I asked people to call me and share a story with me about a life-changing moment. Their stories became the art as I wrote them onto the revolving canvas. <laughs> or what if instead of making art to display, I had to destroy it? This seemed like the ultimate limitation, being an artist without art. This destruction idea turned into a year-long project that I called Goodbye Art, where each and every piece of art had to be destroyed after its creation. In the beginning of Goodbye Art, I focused on forced destruction, like this image of Jimi Hendrix, made with over 7,000 matches. <laughs> then I opened it up to creating art that was destroyed naturally. I looked for temporary materials, like spitting out food. sidewalk chalk, and even frozen wine. The, the last iteration of destruction was to try to produce something that didn't actually exist in the first place. So I organized candles on a table, I lit them and then blew them out, then repeated this process over and over with the same set of candles, then assembled the videos into the larger image. So the end image was never visible as a physical whole. It was destroyed before it ever existed. In the course of this Goodbye Art series, I created 23 different pieces with nothing left to physically display. What I thought would be the ultimate limitation actually turned out to be the ultimate liberation, as each time I created, the destruction brought me back to a neutral place where I felt refreshed and ready to start the next project. It, didn't, it did not happen overnight. <laughs> there were times when my projects failed to get off the ground, or even worse, after spending tons of time on them, the end image was kind of embarrassing. But having committed to the process, I continued on, and something really surprising came out of this. As I destroyed each project, I was learning to let go. Let go of outcomes, let go of failures, and let go of imperfections. And in return, I found a process of creating art that's perpetual and unencumbered by results. I found myself in a state of constant creation, thinking only of what's next and coming up with more ideas than ever. When I think back to my three years away from art, away from my dream, just going through the motions, instead of trying to find a different way to continue that dream, I just quit. I gave up. And what if I didn't embrace the shake? Because embracing the shake for me wasn't just about art and having art skills. It turned out to be about life and having life skills. Because ultimately, most of what we do takes place here, inside the box with limited resources. Learning to be creative within the confines of our limitations is the best hope we have to transform ourselves and collectively transform our world. Looking at limitations as a source of creativity changed the course of my life. Now, when I run into a barrier or I find myself creatively stumped, I sometimes still struggle, but I continue to show up for the process and try to remind myself of the possibilities, like using hundreds of real live worms to make an image, <laughs> using a pushpin to tattoo a banana, or painting a picture with hamburger grease. <laughs> One of my most recent endeavors is to try to translate the habits of creativity that I've learned into something others can replicate. Limitations may be the most unlikely of places to harness creativity, but perhaps one of the best ways to get ourselves out of ruts, rethink categories, and challenge accepted norms and instead of telling each other to seize the day, maybe we can remind ourselves every day to seize the limitation. Thank you. Seize the limitation. You know, I, uh, I remember being in the cabin when we started four years ago, and we wanted to have a children's ministry, wanted to have a band, and uh, praying, and I'm just getting kind of discouraged a little bit at first, not knowing who, and um, I remember feeling from scripture and from prayer, God saying to me, 
You already have everything you need right now to be the body of Christ right now. Do good with what you got to my glory, and in time I'll give you more. I'll give you your needs. And uh, I remember uh, a, a little church, a little group of uh, people saying, we're going to do Rock the Ridge uh, out in our community to give back just because God is about love. There was only one challenge is we couldn't afford it. And we, didn't even, we weren't even self-supported, but we thought, let's step out on faith and let's see what happens. And now we're getting ready to do our 10th one and be a blessing to our community. And uh, all these ministries, a lot of times that have risen up, we, we, it's just people saying, I want to try it. I want to give it a shot. And I think one of the, most big, the greatest limitations is when we say, well, I can't do this because I'm limited. We forget that God is unlimited and that working through our perceived weakness is what God majors in. Paul says, I will brag in my weaknesses. I'll boast in my weaknesses because when I'm weak, then I'm strong because I'm depending on God. And what's sad is in the world, you're told, oh, you're too dumb or you're too ugly or you're too old. You're past your window or you're too young. Get the kids out of the way. And so we're told uh, we don't measure up and we're, we have this airbrushed kind of ideal of what perfection is. And all along, God can do incredible things through us, through our limitations, if we'll learn to embrace the shake. My mom was real good at that. I would come home from school and say, Mom, I'm fat. She would say, you're not fat, you're husky. <laughs> I'm kind of going, yeah, I'm just husky. I'm getting huskier and huskier. <laughs> be who you are is what she taught me and what I pass on my kids. If you don't be you, nobody's going to be you. Be who you are. Don't let people put you in a box. Now, then he says... Talking about uh, inside the box, he puts a spin on the whole think outside the box. I like the idea of think outside the box, the concept, you know, like the seven last words of a dying church, or we've never done it that way before. You know, we can't, we're, we're, we're boxed in, or others are telling us what it means to be a Christ follower, and we live in a box. I don't agree with that. But what I love of what he says is we think we're limited because of the box we're in, or the, that, that thing that you have, that perceived weakness may be the very thing that God wants to use to his glory. He majors in working in that. When we went to um, Fresno when I was five, I went to kindergarten there in Clovis. My dad wanted to go to barber school. He'd been working in the oil fields and he wanted to be a barber. So there was a barber college there. And I learned from my mom that there are all kinds of ways to eat beans and cornbread. Did you know that? It's amazing the things you can do with beans, hot sauce, ketchup, uh, mayonnaise, Mmm, that'll make you husky, but boy, tasty, you know. There's jelly. Uh, I learned so many ways you can eat beans, but we got through college. And then my dad built a great business there in, in Kalinga, our hometown where I was born, and then decided he wanted to move to Santa Cruz. So we moved to Santa Cruz, starts a shop. That's where I started learning again about how to pass out flyers around town, getting ready for Rock the Ridge training when I was a kid. And uh, there was only one challenge going on. My dad was a barber, and it was the 60s. And we were in Santa Cruz, <laughs> you know, hair down to here, right? Remember the, the Haight-Ashbury days and all of that? Well, uh, my dad decided to learn to do styling. That kind of helped. Razor cuts were the new thing back then. My mom went to work in the Wrigley's plant uh, and worked up to an operator position, operating machinery. They would put the initials of the operator on those silver Wrigley's gum wrappers, and we as kids would look to see if mom's initials were on there. My dad went through some challenges for a certain time period, and my mom was the breadwinner, and she worked hard. One day she came home, and uh, or she was getting ready to go to work, and she saw us kind of having a tough time adjusting to a new school. She goes, you know, I'm going to take the day off. And she drove me around town all day. And uh, we just spent the day together. That was my mom. My mom taught me, you jump a hurdle if you get a hurdle in your way. And if you fall down, you get back up. And she learned that from her mom, who had 12 kids. My mom was the youngest. D. Graham, we call her. And she, in depression time, moved from Oklahoma to find work in the fields out here in California. And she said things that my mom passed on to us, that we pass on to our kids, like, uh, don't feel sorry for yourself. Count your blessings. Count your blessings, get up, get busy, and do something. And uh, so mom helped me about hurdles, and then when you do blow it, she gave me unconditional love, said get up and get on with it. The third point task is to finish strong. It's a, it's a long-distance race. It's not a sprint. And sometimes we go through a difficulty, a bad church experience or whatever. We go, maybe I should just bag it 
and, and we got our eyes off of Jesus because Jesus went all the way, man. He went to the cross. He did not give up when it was hard, and we follow him, and God wants us to finish strong uh, all of our life to live this life out following him. Um, in 1 Corinthians 9, Paul says, do, not, do you not know that in a race all the runners run, but only one gets the prize? Run in such a way as to get the prize. Everyone who competes in the games goes into strict training. They do it to get a crown that will not last, but we do it to get a crown that will last forever. I, I sent Howard a picture of uh, a stadium, an ancient stadium, and uh, they, would have, they would gather in these stands to cheer on uh, the different contests and the athletes would come a lot of the, the biggie was at the end where the races and they had different lengths of races and uh, but the athletes a lot of times were there either for the multiple multitude of gods that they believed in or ultimately to the emperor you watch some movies sometimes and they salute the emperor they're they're uh they're living they're running this race for an emperor and paul says we run for a crown that will last forever. He wrote someone he mentored named Timothy, and he said, for I am already being poured out like a drink offering, and the time of my departure is near. I have fought the good fight. I have finished the race. I have kept the faith. Now there is in store for me the crown of righteousness, which the Lord, the righteous judge, will award to me on that day, and not only to me, but to all of those who have longed for his appearing. When I... Uh, Lost my dad. I was a sophomore in college. Blew my knee out. Dropped out of school for a little while. I lost scholarship hopes. Decided to move to Morro Bay. Lived with some football players and surfers. I was going to rehab and walk on at Cal Poly and try to play ball there. But we mostly partied. And, and I kind of got away from church altogether at that point without my dad in my life. And what I found is, even at the party, it wasn't, there was still something missing in my, my heart. There was a loneliness. Even in a crowd, in a party, you could be lonely. And there was this band, this young band, maybe you heard of, called Leonard Skinner. Uh, they were new, you know, or pretty new. They were playing, this was back in the Freebird era. Yeah, and uh, so there was a song they used to sing called Simple Man. And that song gave me fits because it was like the wisdom from my mom that she passed on to me. So I'd be at a party there. And I would hear my mom preaching at me, be a simple kind of man. See, simple doesn't mean shallow. Simple can be very profound. Uh, don't forget that there's someone up above. Find a woman, you'll find love. Find a woman to build a family. Build something that will last, that matters, like you've grown up in. Build a family. Forget lusting after the rich man's gold. All you need is in your soul who you are. Uh, uh, follow Christ, follow God, of course, is what she passed on to me. That song would haunt me, you know, and, but it actually helped call me back uh, to Christ. And uh, I found that woman, like my, my mom encouraged me to do and have had a family. Fast forward, um, we have a wedding party for my son, Zach, at my house. We have asked Stillwater Savage to play. He likes him a lot, and yeah, he likes that country flavor, so that was cool. And then they saw Dave in their audience, asked Dave to come join and play a song. And Dave starts playing Simple Man. And I go, Mom, my mom's 80 years old. I go, Mom, got to dance. He goes, really? He goes, oh, okay, let's go for it. So we go out there, and breathing wasn't real good at those days. It probably I wasn't being a good son. But I just had to dance with her because it was our song. And we danced to, to Simple Man. I didn't know it was the last year of her life but I cherish that dance. And the thing that keeps me positive, uh, even on Mother's Day, is I know where she is right now. She's in those stands. She's in that stands with those witnesses, Abraham and Isaac and Jacob and Joseph, those people of faith up there with Walt and with Laura and Phyllis and others and Forrest and people that have gone on before us. And you know what they're doing there in the stands? They're looking at us and they're saying, run. Run, run, you run your race, run, put one foot in front of the other, keep going, jump that hurdle, jump that hurdle, you fall down, get back up, keep going, you finish strong, finish strong, don't let anybody tell you how to run, don't look around at other people how they're running, you run your race, you jump those hurdles and you finish strong, amen? amen. That's why I say let's keep going, let's live life fully alive. Let's be who God created us to be. Let's embrace any shake we got and uh, not be those kind of people who blame circumstances or weaknesses and don't do nothing. 
Let's be like those winners who take what they've been given and they live life fully alive and run their race. Let's pray together. And as you're bowed and uh, as you're praying, I don't know where you're at on Mother's Day, uh, but God does. And I, I do want to tell you this. I know some of us didn't get to have a mom that uh, loved us unconditionally or led us spiritually. And if that's your case, I want you to know there is a God in heaven that is both father and mother to us. And he loves you unconditionally. And he will hold you spiritually. He's not mad at you. He's not wanting you to try to earn anything. He wants you to believe in his son Jesus and give him your life. And maybe there's some here who um, wanted to be moms physically but never have been able to. And I want you to know this. This is a believe with all my heart. There are so many mothers in the kingdom of God who never had a child physically. There's so much mothering that goes on, even by men in the kingdom. I believe that the scripture teaches that men can mother and father and women can mother and father. I've been fathered by a lot of powerful women in the kingdom that encourage and nurture and challenge. So you are a mom if you're in the kingdom of God. You have great opportunities. And Father, for those of us that had a mom that taught us and uh, we're always there, we give you thanks, we honor them, help us to imitate their faith and run that race, jump any hurdles in the way and finish strong to your glory, keeping our eyes on Jesus, the author and perfecter of our faith. Amen. Amen. Let's stand together and worship God.
Now it's time to pray for our offering. Oh, that's a little wimpy. Now it's time to pray for our offering. Yeah, all right. Let's pray. Father, we do want to give cheerfully and let go. You've taught us that life is not just about being consumers, but making a donation with our life, making a contribution. If there's someone here, Lord, that's going through a hard time, uh, financially help them not to feel guilty in this type time of our service, but to just give their heart to you. Uh, also, for our guests that are here, our, our service, just let that be a gift to them, God. But for those of us that are committed to the vision of hope, pray that we'll give cheerfully. Father, please help us to be a force of hope on the ridge and beyond until Jesus comes. Help us to bring love and uh, acceptance and encouragement and creativity uh, to a dying world that needs hope desperately. Father, we can't do it without you, and we don't want to, so please help us in this. We give you praise and glory. In Jesus' name, amen.
find yourself Follow your home And nothing else You can do this for me If you try Cause all I want from you, my son How do we do that? Love God, love people. Thanks for being here. Have an awesome week. Remember, every day this week in Christ, we always have hope. Happy Mother's Day.